Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kevin Butterfield, the director of the Washington Library at Mount Vernon. Thrilled to welcome you to day five of our five-day George Washington Symposium. This year in 2020, uh, being held fully virtually and fully free for those of you around the country, around the world that wanna have access to these great conversations on elections that have shaped the American presidency. I wanna give you a sense of what we've done this week because we're building it into a great conversation today on the election of 1960. Uh, but for the first two days of this week, and these are all still available at mountvernon.org slash GW Symposium, uh, we spoke with two different scholars on Washington's own political experiences, with David Stewart on his colonial era elections to the Virginia House of Burgesses and his formative years, with Dr. Jeff Pasley at the University of Missouri on the first presidential elections, taking us all the way up through the elections of Adams and Jefferson. We joined Elizabeth Barron on Wednesday for a conversation about Lincoln's elections in 1860 and 1864. And just yesterday, we spoke with the historian emeritus of the United States Senate, Don Ritchie, about the election of 1932, uh, which brought FDR into a, a transformative presidency uh, for the next um, many, many years. Today, we'll be uh, talking with Alan Price about the election of 1960 when JFK joined the presidency. Um, the, this is a, a remarkable uh, opportunity for us to look at some uh, uh, across the broad swath of American history uh, with some Q&As with, with fascinating people who have uh, devoted their lives to the study of these subjects. You have an opportunity to ask questions as well. So as we talk today with Alan Price, please be thinking about what you would like to ask about the election of 1960 or about JFK or about Richard Nixon uh, and submit them into the chat function and we'll come to those questions about halfway through our time together. Um, on behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association uh, uh, and with the support of the Barra Foundation out of Philadelphia, as well as the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy at the University of Missouri, uh, we're able to bring you this great series. Uh, next year, we hope we can do it on site again at Mount Vernon, uh, but for now, uh, we're happy to be joining you in your living rooms. Uh, this is our 25th year for this important symposium. Uh, we are, are thrilled uh, to be able to make it free and available. Uh, thank you for being such a faithful and attentive audience this week. Uh, and again, go back and watch the ones that you happen to have missed. Uh, they've all been outstanding. Our guest today, Alan Price, is the director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. He's been there since 2018. Uh, prior to that, he was the president of Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. Uh, he also served in the Obama administration in a couple of important roles uh, and has a JD from Harvard Law School, has an undergraduate degree from Earlham College. He and his wife, Gina LaRoche, have two sons, live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Excited to talk to him about this election of 1960. Alan, welcome. Kevin, thank you so much. It's great to be with you today. Oh, I'm so glad you could do it. Uh, and I wonder if we could just start. Uh, let's. We've got an hour together, uh, but uh, I, I, there's a lot to talk about. So let's get right into the the landscape in 1960. If you're uh, imagining uh, or trying to to get a sense of what this election is going to be, you don't know how it turns out. You don't know anything about the outcomes. Um, what's what 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 does the world look like in January or, or early 1960? Uh, can you set the political landscape, maybe the geopolitical landscape around the world? What do we know? It's a very uh, difficult race to predict for so many reasons. It's it's a tight race all the way through, uh, but the larger geopolitical setting is we've got the Cold War going on. Uh, during the Eisenhower administration, of which Nixon is vice president. Uh, we have Sputnik go up into space in 57. The space race is on. The, the missile gap concerns are being raised. Uh, Gary Powers is shot down, uh, you know, and the, and the Soviets have him. Uh, it is a really tense time uh, geopolitically abroad. And you have a real crescendo coming on in the form domestically uh, in the form of the civil rights movement and uh, we have our essentially apartheid system going on and the, and we have a very divided america uh, between black and white and north and south uh, and uh, and all in this we have a new sense of media that so much more is visible on television uh, than ever before so uh, people can see the inequities going on, can see the struggle, uh, and are really torn what to do about it. And I think uh, both Republicans and Democrats find themselves trying to walk a tightrope of trying to get votes 
knowing full well that if they go too much against the establishment, uh, which is in many ways segregationist, they could lose the establishment vote. But if they get, if they try to, uh, you know, if they try to stay establishment, they might lose the progressive vote, vote and lose the black vote. It's it's a really tight uh, rope to walk. It's real. It's an interesting uh, 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 so the civil rights focus that you brought in uh, raises a, an important question. You mentioned Nixon as the vice president uh, for the last eight years. Is he running as a status quo candidate? How, how is he positioning himself? Uh, in in the in the in context of, of looking forward, but also having been a part of the previous administration. Yes, I, it's unclear to me whether he's trying to uh, represent the establishment, but certainly Kennedy is trying to paint him as representing not only the establishment, but what is wrong with the establishment and what is wrong with the past. And uh, and even though Kennedy and Nixon came into Congress the same year. And there's only three years of age difference between the two of them. For many people, Kennedy is able to successfully uh, paint himself as representing the future and new ideas and leading change. Uh, at the same time, Nixon is trying to paint Kennedy with a label of being young and inexperienced. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, it, and that's an interesting uh, test. Uh, there are many people, even within the Democratic Party, who are concerned about Kennedy's level of experience. You add to that uh, concerns about being Irish Catholic, when, and we haven't had a Catholic uh, elected president, and Al Smith is you know, wiped out in, the, I guess it's 28. Um, and so there are concerns about his electability. And, uh, and obviously the South is very concerned that he is this Northern uh, person who may not understand uh, their segregationist ways. Uh, it's it's really an interesting as they try to paint each other with these different labels. What will stick? So uh, let's uh, let's uh, take a moment to, to to talk about Eisenhower, uh, who has uh, I think served a a, a well received eight years as president. He seems to be a popular president. Uh, um, uh, of course, I think we have some shots of Nixon and Eisenhower standing together. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about how people uh, felt about Dwight D. Eisenhower? Were they ready to move on? I, I don't know. T talk to us a little bit about uh, the, the legacy that Nixon is, is, uh, has uh, having been uh, with Eisenhower for the previous eight years. What, what, what do you know about Eisenhower's um, yeah. uh, reputation in this moment? Eisenhower certainly does not have a bad reputation. Uh, Kennedy does what he can to pick up on things, uh, particularly uh, in Nixon's own words in ways that uh, might suggest that there were errors during that administration. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he tries, what, it's unclear at that time whether there is actually a missile gap uh, in, in preparation uh, that might leave us vulnerable in a, a nuclear war scenario, uh, but he sticks that label on, on that administration and Nixon's part in it in a way that Nixon doesn't really successfully rebut, certainly not vigorously. Uh, and it's, it's probably at that point unprovable either way. We may not have actual intelligence reports. Uh, and, and I think uh, Nixon was trying to, or certainly Eisenhower was of the belief that the, the Soviets, uh, even if they had quantity of weapons would not have had quality and accuracy within those weapons. So I don't. I think he downplayed the threat, which may have been a misstep. Uh, I think that it, that may be the the one area where Kennedy was to, able to sort of play into people's fears. And I think during later in his presidency, use those to really build American strength in that area, you know, in a fascinating way. But uh, Nixon, I think, is also undermined by Eisenhower, uh, uh, because it comes out in one of the, you know, in the tele the live televised debate, one of the questions is, uh, they had asked Eisenhower, uh, what was a significant contribution that Nixon made during the administration? And Eisenhower said, I don't know, if you give me a week, I might think of something. And so uh, <laughs> with with such damning praise uh, from Eisenhower, uh, I think a lot of people may have come away with the impression that Nixon was not as strong 
as the Eisenhower administration might suggest. Well, let me ask one last question on setting the stage for 1960. Uh, as, as you know, we're in the midst of a presidential election year, so everyone knows that the state of the economy is a big deal when you're running as sort of the incumbent, or in this case, uh, uh, something similar. Uh, we're econ economic times, were things flush? I think that people think of the 1950s as, as flush and robust. Is that how people would have felt in 1960? That's certainly how uh, Nixon tries to portray his record and certainly the Eisenhower administration record. Uh, you know, it, the, the question that we now ask in, in some ways, the, the Reagan question, are you better off today than four years ago? Uh, I think in an earlier iteration of that, that is exactly where Nixon wants to focus, mm -hmm. uh, that we're doing fine. And by these various measures, and I think actually in the live te televised debate, he comes across a bit wonkish, policy wonkish, mm -hmm. throwing out uh, more numbers and stats uh, than the average person would actually process. Right. I think uh, Kennedy tries to flip it and say, this is the wrong question. It's not, are we better off today than a year ago or two years ago? It's where do we stand via our vis-a-vis -vis our competitor, the Soviet system? And are we stronger versus them today? And will we be stronger four years from now and 10 years from now and uh and and getting people to focus on that race and that competitive drive i think takes uh people's attention away from what by many measures is a strong economic record yeah that that's a, a fascinating way to reframe that question uh that jfk pulls off uh, well, i think it's a good opportunity for us to uh to dive into uh the, the two men uh, JFK, uh, you mentioned that he's a northerner. Clearly, we, we know his accent. But uh, so, uh, tell us a little bit about his life story up till 1960. Well, uh, not everybody knows it, uh, but uh, those who do get a story of Kennedy as a war hero. Uh, so he, he really comes to prominence uh, based on his record in World War II as uh, commander of PT-109, uh, where his ship is um, slammed into by the Japanese destroyer, the Amagiri, off the Solomon Islands. Uh, he, uh, you know, two uh, seamen are lost in that collision. He saves the rest of his crew. They swim to a nearby island. Uh, They're able to uh, inscribe in a coconut husk, uh, uh, basically an SOS rescue message, which uh, the the folks who, who live there, they, they uh, happen upon some people who are from the Solomon Islands. They take that husk and swim it out to an Australian ship some miles offshore. The Australians relay the message to the American Navy that 11 are still alive on Noro Island. And the Navy had thought they were all lost in the collision. So then yeah. the Navy, Navy is able to rescue them. He is a legitimate war hero uh, and stories are written about it. And, uh, and based on that strength, he's able to uh, ride into Congress and then the U.S. Senate and uh, is a strong war hero uh, candidate for the presidency, although I think by most measures, a long shot. He doesn't really have the national recognition that some other people have. And because he has an Irish Catholic background, uh, he doesn't get the support that you might expect uh, for a strong candidate. And because he's young and charming, uh, some of the establishment criticize him for not having uh, a depth of a record, for being too young for the office, uh, mm -hmm. and not being as serious a candidate as they'd like to see. Eleanor Roosevelt, for example, much prefers Adlai Stevenson as a candidate. And it's only when he is able to meet with her in person that that charm works and that depth comes across. And she is persuaded that he is the candidate. Wow. The Kennedy uh, family is, is, of course, a legendary dynasty at this point. What's the, what's the status of the Kennedy family in 1960? Well, obviously, his older brother uh, is lost in World War II uh, in, a, in a bombing raid over Europe. And, uh, but it was thought that his older brother would really be the, the political front. Uh, and so it's only after his brother's uh, death that JFK uh, comes to the forefront as carrying the mantle. But his father had very high hopes 
uh, for his chick children, particularly the male children. Uh, but the, the women did incredible things as well. Uh, but the system of those days did not support their accomplishments nearly the same way. Uh, but they have wealth. And that wealth does come into effect, uh, particularly in the early part of the campaign, where uh, I think much like people give credit to Carter for campaigning early, uh, Kennedy, in his own way, campaigned early and mm -hmm. used the primary systems uh, in a way that nobody had used them before because he had the money to have a private plane and travel around the country and meet as many people as possible and charm them in person, uh, often with Ted Sorison by his side to record uh, who did he meet with and write them thank you notes and things like that later, uh, but to try to get as many delegates as you could. Unlike today, where we have uh, primaries all over the place, at the time, there were only 17 primaries, uh, 16 plus uh, the District of Columbia. And of those uh, 17, most of them were, uh, you know, for favored sons. <laughs> you, would, you would give your local hero uh, a few delegates to go into the convention and the convention is where it was all sorted out. In fact, mm -hmm. Nixon's uh, claim in the uh, and why he was uh, in part picked to be vice president was because Nixon was so instrumental in Eisenhower's capturing the convention when he did. Uh, Kennedy puts a lot of focus on the primaries, uh, wins the ten that he's in, uh, and nobody else competes in that many. Hmm. In fact, Johnson doesn't compete in any primaries. He just assumes, and he is the establishment, that he will go into the convention and have the support. And in many ways, he was right. But the primaries put Kennedy, put a spotlight on Kennedy in ways that he had hoped. And I think others, uh, they had not anticipated this strategy. It strikes me that this is that's a turning point then. From JFK on, the, the, the primaries play a, a larger role in, in the direction of the party's choice. They do. They, he really that initiative shapes American politics forever. A lot of our listeners are probably wondering, what are the other states doing? Uh, if only 16 plus DC are having primaries, what's happening elsewhere? Uh, they are sending their delegates to the convention where it will be sorted out, uh, where the party machine will choose wisely based on their actual knowledge of the candidates. Hmm. Uh, the democratization of the party doesn't really happen until uh, much later. Uh, but the, these are early efforts. You know, you, you look to 68 and other uh, later conventions as where, you know, the place where democratization uh, more readily happens. Okay, we've set the stage for JFK a bit. Obviously, there's more to say. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Richard Nixon in 1960? We mentioned the vice presidency, but what, what else do we know about him uh, in his background before uh, this important presidential election? Uh, he is um, he is in in many ways the standard bearer for his party and acknowledged as such. There are also those who have concerns about him. Um, he is not particularly charismatic. He uh, is not particularly well liked by people who know him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so you know compromises are struck, and I think he is a solid uh, compromise candidate. Uh, do, do you have a read on how a non-charismatic, not particularly liked person uh, become, ultimately does become president someday? Uh, how does Richard Nixon uh, fi find a way to make it work? Uh, I think he does it on, on uh, experience and competence. Hmm. Uh, that, that is what his claim boils down to. Uh, he has a record. He's happy to run on his record. He often doesn't state his record. He just uses the word record. And he said, you know, my record is there for the people to see, and I hope people will uh, support that record. You, uh, so we, you, and you also did set the stage a bit for the Democratic National Convention. When, when it came to selecting Nixon, uh, was there much competition uh, and on the Republican side as the, as the ultimate nominee? Uh, I, I believe there was, but I think, uh, I think there, there was a sense of the status quo was good and that should be good enough. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, quite rightly, based on what they knew at the time, they probably thought Nixon would beat Kennedy. Uh, they didn't think Kennedy had a strong enough record. There was enough reason to think that he would be marginalized. Uh, they, 
on areas like civil rights, uh, there wasn't, at least initially, that big a difference uh, in their records. Hmm. And uh, and I and I think there the Republicans probably had good confidence they would win that race and that's all they needed to do. Um, you, in, in describing this and, and a sense of, of who may win and, and come out on top, I'm reminded of, of a question we asked yesterday uh, regarding the 1932 election. How sophisticated is polling? Do people, uh, are people watching the polls on a daily basis the way we do today or is it not quite there yet? What, what's, what's the status of polling and understanding the popular opinion? It, it, it's very much on their mind. Uh, polling is is present, certainly. It's not the same level of sophistication and prominence and daily check, but the Gallup poll is running, and uh, and Kennedy and his advisors are very much on top of it. And, uh, and actually going into the, I believe it's the Wisconsin primary, uh, you know, the, the media, in many ways, charmed by him, uh, you know, wants to label him the front runner, and mm-hmm. Kennedy wants to push back on that. Uh, I think smartly because being labeled the front runner is, does not necessarily help your cause. <laughs> yeah, and so funny. he would say, "This is a very tight race. We're going to have to work very hard," and uh, and, and so he he tries to avoid the labeling that the polls uh, put on him. But uh, but he's very conscious of it, and uh, and certainly his advisors are very conscious of it. So I want to remind everyone: uh, be please be submitting questions. Uh, we would love to come to audience questions soon and uh, have an opportunity to to dive more into the election of 1960, into the life and and legacy of John F. Kennedy, uh, with our guest Alan Price, the director of the of the JFK Library. Um, of course, I think everyone with some even rudimentary knowledge of American uh, political history knows that the debates mattered in 1960. So uh, let's let's skip ahead. We have two candidates. We have Nixon and Kennedy, and uh, they have they have a debate. Um, I tell I set the stage for this, and um, is it as important as as the popular wisdom has it to be uh, that these were televised? I believe it is important. You know, when at the end of the day, there are a number of things that are very important. And there's only a little bit more than 100,000 votes that separate them in the popular vote. Uh, and so, you know, out of 68 million votes cast. And this is one of those important things. Whereas, you know, at the start of the Eisenhower administration, um, you know, 15, 18% of American households have televisions. By the end of the Eisenhower administration, it's, you know, upper 80% of American households have televisions. So, to have the first live televised debate when the vast majority of American households have or have access to a television to see it, it's just the new media of its day. And John F. Kennedy, uh, in part with some coaching, his father arranges for some, uh, I'll say some Hollywood producer like coaching. This is how you interact with a camera. This is how you stand. This is, you have to have a suit of a color that contrasts with the background that so that you stand out. Uh, mm. You will get the Hollywood makeup. All, all of that happens for Kennedy. And it happens to him before he enters the studio. And when the, when the producers of the debate say, do you want makeup? Kennedy says, no, I'm good. And they ask Nixon, do you want makeup? And he says, no, I'm good. But Nixon didn't get it in advance. <laughs> and, and and Nixon was just coming off an illness and recovery uh, so that he had lost some weight. And his suit uh, for that first debate is actually somewhat, uh, it fades into the background. Uh, it's not actually the same contrast that you see in this image right here. This yeah. is one of the, the later debates. That first one, it, his suit fades into the background. It doesn't seem well-fitting. He seems ill at ease and he's sweating and mopping his brow because it doesn't have the makeup on to reduce the glare. Uh, And so all these things come to to be such that the majority of people who see that first debate live believe that Kennedy wins it. But the majority, slight majority of people who only listened on the radio think that Nixon won that debate. Uh, 
but this is the new media and that makes a difference and people's opinions were formed. And even though Nixon, I think, does better in later debates, people's minds were made up. I, I wonder, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating story. I had no idea about the makeup. That's a remarkable anecdote. But I, I'm curious about uh, how these might feel to us uh, having, I, I'll leave aside the most recent presidential debates, but you know, the recent years of presidential debates, would this feel familiar? Uh, was, was, uh, was the was was the format familiar? Was the, the back and forth the, uh, the sort of thing we're comfortable with? Or uh, was this uh, a, a different uh, feeling altogether? I would say it was very different in one regard, and it's not just the current election. I would say it's very different from uh, certainly uh, all the uh, debates in my memory uh, mm. sense, in the sense that it is incredibly civil. They're respectful of each other. They don't, it's not just a matter of do they interrupt or not interrupt. I know that's a current uh, issue on the table. Uh, Certainly nobody interrupted back then, but they would each say, uh, I trust that you represent the views of your party and you would trust that I represent the views of my party and the American people have a choice to make about which party's views uh, uh, offer a better view of the future. Uh, they would say things like that in, in ways that are really just, they stand out as, boy, those times are gone. Wow. Um, <laughs> And I, I also think that Kennedy had great command of the stats and uh, both economic and, um, and, and I'll just say other uh, important numbers of the time in ways that he could relate them to the American people in bite-sized morsels uh, very well. Uh, I think in a way that you don't see again until Bill Clinton, perhaps. Hmm. Uh, so uh, we've we've described uh, John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, um, the the women around them, and let's talk particularly about about Jackie Kennedy. Um, ha, uh, uh, certainly, uh, we uh, she has still has as uh, iconic status in, in American uh, memory. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about her role in 1960? Uh, does she play an active role? Is she is she uh, left aside or kept? kept off to the side entirely. What's, what's her role? What do we know about her impact? Well, she is a tremendous, uh, you know, X factor, if you will, in this campaign. She's not, remember, before they're actually elected, before Kennedy is elected, she doesn't have that iconic status, right? The Kennedys aren't the Kennedys yet. Yeah. They're trying to become that household name. And both of them are incredibly charming. She's still a very young bride uh, going into this. Uh, her sense of uh, style and fashion is powerful with every audience uh, she greets. And she's a, she's a real charmer. Uh, and as Kennedy is secretly barnstorming the nation, uh, going to these various places, sometimes Mrs. Kennedy would also be there. Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly, you know, there's... Um, in the trip to New Orleans, uh, this is early on, the trip to New Orleans where there's a large uh, Catholic population and there is a large French-speaking population. And Mrs. Kennedy is fluent in French and, and quite good in Spanish as well. And uh, so when they go to speak to the group assembled uh, in New Orleans, Mrs. Kennedy speaks first. And she tells this wonderful story in French, saying that she was always raised to believe that New Orleans and Louisiana is part of France, and therefore we would feel very welcome there. And the crowd just erupts. They just love her, right? <laughs> and, uh, and that sets the stage for Kennedy to, you know, Kennedy is a persuasive, charismatic speaker in his own right, but I think Mrs. Kennedy already had them. That's great. Um, you know, there's uh, we have some images of, of a visit made, of course, after the election uh, with President and Mrs. Kennedy uh, coming to Mount Vernon. Uh, and so give people some sense of her style uh, and, and, and presence and charisma. Uh, this is uh, uh, them having a state dinner outside of the White House, which was uh, uh, the first time that it happened uh, at Mount Vernon on the grounds of Mount Vernon. Um, and, uh, and I, I just think it's, it's a great, uh, this comes out of your archive, by the way, Alan, uh, the JFK library, uh, some great color photography, uh, that showed just how dashing the couple was that here they are with the prime minister of, of Pakistan and his wife. 
Well, also no, uh, not just Pakistan, but the the emergence of several new nations coming out of uh, colonization, right? So new new free nations are coming on board at this moment. And uh, the Kennedy's recognition of these new nations and inviting them to state dinners and uh, and and treating them uh, treating a, a new African nation with the same dignity that they would British royalty went a, a long way uh, towards persuading the world that America was the ally to have. Wow, um, th this is a. a, a a really great introduction. I'm, I, we're going to go to audience questions soon because uh, I'm sure we have more to dive into. Uh, I, I do think it's important that we uh, grapple with uh, one of those uh, burdens that John F. Kennedy had while running for president, uh, that he needed to persuade many Americans uh, that his being a, a Roman Catholic was not going to be a, a barrier to, a, to a, a positive and successful presidency. Uh, could you talk to us a bit about what uh, many Americans were uh, concerned about what exactly is the anxiety, first of all, and how does John F. Kennedy manage it? So the anxiety is, would an American president be loyal to the Pope rather than the Constitution in the U.S.? Uh, would, would the orders come from the Vatican? Uh, it was a concern that uh, I think he skirts and downplays for a while, and then he, I think, wakes up because he does win the Wisconsin primary, uh, and there is a, a large uh, Catholic contingent there in Wisconsin, but he doesn't win it by the margin he wanted to win it, right? It's not as resounding a landslide uh, as he wants. And so that's where I think he realizes we're going to have to speak to this directly. And, uh, and there are interviews televised where reporters ask the questions around what does it mean uh, for, you know, for you to be Catholic and uh, where do your uh, loyalties lie? And I think that's where uh, Kennedy comes back to his record, his war record, his service in the Congress, his service uh, both as a congressman and a senator, and that uh, he would be, uh, his loyalty has been and will always be to the Constitution of the United States. And I don't think he minds the question at that point because he realized in the Wisconsin results that he needed to address it squarely. And uh, particularly going into the West Virginia primary, uh, where that was going to be uh, incredibly hotly contested uh, because uh, even though Johnson is not running uh, in that primary, uh, Johnson is friends with Byrd uh, from West Virginia mm -hmm. and Senator Byrd uh, is uh, campaigning for somebody else. And, and trying to undermine Kennedy. And so Kennedy uh, addresses this issue head on and is successful, I think, in educating America, uh, which, you know, that issue of uh, religion for a candidate has come up uh, again and again since then for Romney and others where uh, it may not be perceived as a mainstream uh, religious choice by some. And so some education is necessary. What uh, we have one last area of, of discussion before we go to the audience, uh, and it's the big one. What happens? The election of 1960. We come to the first Tuesday uh, in November. Uh, can you tell us uh, uh, how how it plays out? What happens on election day? How does JFK come out on top? I think a little appreciated thing uh, that goes into election day is uh, is uh, Nixon's stubbornness. <laughs> Uh, Kennedy has traveled to all 50 states, and, and, but not necessarily during his campaign. He has traveled to all 50 states in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, Nixon had not. And so Kennedy, you know, glosses over a little bit, but he says we're going to campaign. Kennedy says we're going to campaign in all 50 states. He doesn't quite actually visit all 50 during the campaign. Nixon says... I'm going to campaign in all 50 states and stubbornly does. And the weekend before the election day, Nixon is off in Alaska to check the 50th box, right? Because Alaska and Hawaii have just become states. 
So he is doing that. And on that same weekend where he's courting Alaska, uh, Kennedy hits like 17 of the mid-Atlantic states all in that. He just touches base on an airfield, takes off again, goes to the next place. He's just wow. meeting supporters everywhere. And, uh, and I think um, his, his push to the finish line is more strategic. Wow. than Nixon's. And I, th I well, think that's a factor. We, we have the, the electoral map in front of us now. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about how, uh, what, what exactly uh, we're seeing here and how, sure. uh, how close it was? Well, it's incredibly close. We don't know until well into the night, if not the next morning. Uh, Kennedy isn't, uh, doesn't know until the next morning whether he's actually been elected. Uh, they find out, uh, they they tell Caroline uh, the message to go wake your father and, and with the greeting, good morning, Mr. President. Uh, but what we see here on this electoral map might seem very strange uh, to a lot of people. Uh, for example, uh, California goes Republican because uh, Nixon is from California. The South, by and large, goes Democrat uh, because the politics were different then and Johnson. Uh, is a huge factor in uh, appeasing the sentiments of the segregationists of the South. Mm. Um, and so you, you just have a, an electoral map that's different from what you would expect today. And, and it's incredibly close. And the counts not only nationally are close, the counts in many of the states are incredibly close. And uh, there was just no way to tell. You, you, all the newscasters uh, basically have uh, a nail biter to try and sort out. And uh, this is not, uh, we don't have what you have later in election drama around hanging chads or disruptions in electronic voting. Mm -hmm. You have manual voting uh, in a way that um, it just takes time to sort it out to be accurate. Uh, and, and it's exciting. Uh, certainly not a landslide, very close. Very close, and, and and I believe there was uh, there was some discussion of you know whether it was so close that it ought to be contested in some way. Was there any discussion of that? Was uh, did Nixon concede right away and stick with it, or uh, were, were there thoughts about challenging? Nixon does concede right away, and and I give him credit. He's incredibly graceful in that moment uh, where he's speaking to his supporters and saying that uh, President Kennedy has won the election. His supporters are saying, boo, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and Nixon says, well, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, where roles reversed, the room that Kennedy's in would have said the boos, right? It's just, yeah. you know, like this, it, this is the way democracy works. Uh, if, if they win, good for them. It's, it's the subtext of the message. And I actually think he's quite a good sport about it. Uh, even though uh, he and Pat are visibly uh, not happy about it. They do their best to smile, uh, put one foot in front of the other, and, uh, and democracy must move on. And you see that at the inauguration, where uh, you know, the inauguration is a very important symbolic passing uh, the torch from one administration to the next. And uh, when President Kennedy is sworn in, uh, one of the very first people to reach over and congratulate him on stage is Nixon. Uh, that, that is remarkable. And I, 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 I agree with you. I, I come away from, from reading accounts of, of Nixon's um, uh, thoughts about the, about possibly contesting the results uh, with some admiration uh, for the man for making the, the decisions that he did. There's even a moment where uh, he, he notes that it would be bad for the place of the United States in the world to start undercutting our sense of the democratic process by by challenging election results, and uh, it's a it's, it's an important uh, uh, part of, of that legacy. And of course, Nixon does come back and have another shot at it uh, yes. some some years down the road. Uh, if, if okay, we have one other thing. Yes, please. Uh, I, I don't want to hold off audience questions, but I, I do think it's one other important factor to say more Great. about uh, Kennedy and it, at that civil rights moment in time. Uh, there are a few things that come together. And because the ultimate uh, vote count is so close, may also have tipped the scales in Kennedy's favor. Uh, Kennedy doesn't have a great civil rights record to run on. There are a lot of concerns raised about it. Uh, in Kennedy's attempt to court 
the vote. Uh, he's photographed with many people that the black community would consider uh, segregationist, supremacist, uh, and they're concerned, uh, saying, why would we support uh, Kennedy over Nixon? You know, there's no difference between who they are photographed with in terms of the, they do not seem to be advancing our cause. And, uh, and I think Kennedy's uh, campaigning in West Virginia is an eye-opening experience for him in terms of the poverty that some people face in this country. But it's not until uh, the civil rights leaders really criticize him for not being more progressive on these issues, that his, that his camp wakes up more, uh, they, have, uh, they, they integrate their own campaign offices, they begin to integrate uh, their representation at the, the, um, the convention, uh, right? they start to do these things that are noticed but the thing that is truly noticed is in when a number of protesters are arrested, including Dr. Martin Luther King. And then a number of those protesters are released from jail, but not King, that there is great concern that harm will come to Dr. King. And it's at that point that Kennedy intervenes. He intervenes first by calling uh, Coretta Scott King and offering his support, but he also takes action to get him released. And that is noticed in a way that nobody else uh, seemed to express that, that same level of interest. That it was on the heels of a debate at um, Howard University where both candidates were invited and Kennedy showed and Nixon did not. Mm -hmm. And so for Kennedy to show and say the things that needed to be said, and for Kennedy to then take action on behalf of Dr. King, for many people who are either on the fence or not committed to him, they turn the tide there. And it was really very close to the election, uh, just in the last few weeks, that that momentum started to gain and they did make the most of it. So that's an important factor. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, okay, we've covered a lot here. Uh, questions are, are coming in uh, to help us uh, cover some more. Uh, and we have our first question coming, by the way, from a, a supporting sponsor of this event, the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy, which is based at the University of Missouri. Uh, we had a me their associate director join us on Tuesday to talk to us about the first presidential elections. Um, they have a great good question about the legacy of the New Deal. How did the Democratic establishment uh, think about JFK in relation to this powerful uh, uh, legacy left by FDR? Yeah, well, I, I can only say uh, the the a that Kennedy is a huge fan of FDR. Uh, there's correspondence between the two. Uh, FDR is obviously in office for such a long time. Uh, it spans uh, Kennedy's coming of age. Mm. And I think uh, you know a lot of people, your coming of age moment and who you see in the White House White House at that time, uh, in many ways creates an image of what a president is. And I think that is true in part uh, between FDR and uh, President Kennedy. There's also um, adorable correspondence uh, between a uh, very young Bobby Kennedy and FDR, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, FDR ends up uh, say, encouraging Bobby's stamp collecting and sending him some stamps, right? So they are, there is a connection between the families, but knowing that um, Eleanor Roosevelt, again, is just not persuaded that John is ready, does not have the substance uh, mm -hmm. to, to bear that office's responsibilities. And it takes an in-person meeting uh, for her to come around. And, and Eleanor Roosevelt's um, support of Kennedy in turn means a lot to the Democratic establishment. So I, I and, and that, um, that she would have some role in the Kennedy administration later uh, is not only the right thing to do, but it's a tremendous thanks because I don't know that he could have done it without her. That's that's very helpful and, and, and great great context to connect yesterday's conversation with today's. Uh, I, I, we have another question uh, uh, coming in about uh, Kennedy's chronic back pain, injuries from the war. Uh, how did he manage this condition while actively campaigning in 1960? Um, uh, we actually had a similar conversation yesterday with FDR campaigning while dealing with the, the effects of polio. Uh, talk to us about, about Kennedy struggles. Uh, 
it's incredible. He, he not, so first of all, he has many illnesses, uh, through his life. Um, and so I, I won't go into uh, all of them, uh, Atkinson's and, and the like, but he injures his back, uh, playing, uh, football in college. He then really injures his back in the collision, uh, with the ship Amagiri while he is on PT 109. He has back surgery, uh, you know, which pulls him out of the Senate for his uh, recovery. And he has to miss what many people consider a very important uh, moment on whether or not he would uh, vote to uh, censor uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy. And so I, I think a number of people say are, are unclear about Kennedy because he doesn't take as aggressive a stance against McCarthyism as people would hope. Uh, so for, but with all that background, uh, Kennedy has to do a tremendous amount to manage his back pain. And while people can see the rocking chair that's padded that he uses to, in some ways, ease that back pain, uh, the American public doesn't see that he's taking pain meds uh, throughout uh, those days. And, uh, and to be able to be as clear and productive and focused uh, and energetic as he was, given the pain and the pain meds, uh, I think is its own heroism. Great, thank you. There's a, another question that I, I, we, we talked a little bit about it, uh, but uh, maybe not quite enough. I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the effects of, of, of the role that the vice presidential candidates played in this 1960 election. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear, we, we, we certainly see a very strategic selection of candidates, at least in recent yeah. political history. Is that what's happening in 1960? Uh, it is. Uh, obviously, uh, great concern about balancing a ticket, right? So uh, Kennedy coming out of Massachusetts and, and New England, uh, generally uh, balancing it with Johnson uh, is you know feared by many because Johnson does not represent the same values necessarily as Kennedy, but in terms of balancing the ticket to get through the convention uh, could be the genius move. Uh, I think uh, Nixon, for his own part, uh, coming out of California, uh, picks Lodge as his running mate, knowing that uh, Kennedy and Lodge had a very close race before. Hmm. And is this, by picking Lodge, can we undermine Kennedy's base? Uh, geographically, um, although and Lodge is a strong candidate. Was so, that was that a failure? Was that a, 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 a bad decision to try to undercut the base rather than taking a different tack? Can can we see anything in hindsight? Uh, it's possible, hard to speculate. Yeah. Uh, I actually think it was a decent move given the, given the history up to that point. Like I said before, I, I think the Republicans could have reasonably assumed this was going to be a win for them. I'm 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 really curious to hear your thoughts on this uh, because I've always wondered about it. Uh, you you described uh, John F. Kennedy's early uh, efforts on behalf of the civil rights movement, um, uh, and of course we know that Lyndon Baines Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act, signs the Voting Rights Act. How do you see the connection and, and the sort of transfer between the two men on this important issue? Well, not only does Johnson play a huge role, I think, in getting Kennedy elected. Uh, Johnson, uh, I think, does an enormous amount to not only carry forward Kennedy's uh, legacy after Kennedy is assassinated uh, through the, the space program, NASA putting a man on the moon, like Kennedy's vision can't be realized in Kennedy's lifetime. Uh, but Johnson maintains that commitment to be realized. Uh, but Johnson's domestic agenda, in some ways, even more progressive uh, than Kennedy's carries that that sentiment forward marvelously. Uh, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, um, some of the most momentous legislation ever done, and his um, his true skill as uh, as able to uh, maneuver the halls of Congress to make things happen. Uh, Johnson was extraordinary at it. Great. Uh, thank you. Let's go to another question that uh, actually has a nice uh, George Washington hook. Um, we know that George Washington loved the theater, drew on uh, trying to build a public persona. Um, and you described a little bit about Kennedy and, and Hollywood. Uh, can you talk to us about how Kennedy built his public persona? Did he have influences uh, similar to this? 
Uh, indeed, uh, although I will say that the more refined and cultured Kennedy it is probably a lot of Mrs. Kennedy rubbing off on him, uh, but certainly goes well back into the Kennedy family. Uh, you know, the, the Cape Cod Playhouse, for example, has um, records of Joe Kennedy Sr. Uh, coming in the 20s and bringing the Kennedy family, right? So the, and, and that would make the paper, right? Because that was, they were the biggest socialites of Cape Cod at that time. And, um, and, and I think their appreciation of the theater um, coupled with a, a classical education uh, culminating it in Harvard uh, helped him appreciate uh, not only uh, ancient Greek uh, theater and writings, but modern theater as well. So uh, they, I think as a couple, they were very much at home with arts and culture and did all they could to promote it, either in the White House or as they traveled around the country. Uh, thank you. I, uh, there's an, another question coming in, and you mentioned one name, and I, I'll bet he pops up again in your answer to this. Uh, Cynthia Miller would like to know more about the the the, the sort of support uh, that's coming in to uh, these um, uh, the preparing these men uh, for for the campaign and for the debates. Um, is, uh, is Ted Sorensen a part in sort of shaping Kennedy's uh, uh, preparation for for? these public engagements with Nixon. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the uh, the team that's behind them. Yes, uh, clearly Ted Sorensen is a part of it. Uh, I would focus on uh, his brother, Bobby, uh, as somebody who really wanted to make sure that, uh, that Jack was ready to answer the tough questions and frame the answers in such a way that, uh, that people would get it. Uh, and I think while many people would write uh, drafts and submit them to John to consider you, this talking point, that talking point, et cetera. Uh, John really was his own author in terms of taking the best of the bunch and putting his own elegant spin on it in a way that it would come out of him in a way that was truly authentic and would resonate with the American people. So I think the, the final flourishes of the pen are all his, uh, but uh, certainly there are many, many drafts that he had to consider. That's great. Uh, anything, any sense of, of Nixon's support team? Uh, do they also have a sophisticated uh, and, uh, um, I don't know, do they have large campaign staffs in 1960 or are these uh, tiny compared to modern campaigns? They're tiny compared to modern campaigns. And I will say that they were tiny administrations compared to current administrations. You have to appreciate that when the Kennedy administration comes in, it's not like uh, essentially from Nixon's administration on, an administration is thousands of people to run the government. In Kennedy's time, it's about 150 plus secretaries. That's it. Amazing. Yeah. Well, in Washington's time, it's even smaller uh, and it's, a, it's a, a single digits in some ways, but, uh, yeah. but I, I know exactly what you mean, that the growth of, the, of, of these uh, presidential administrations and campaigns uh, just in the last 50 years is really notable. Um, right. Okay. Uh, I can't... Uh, as, as a director of a presidential library, I can't miss this opportunity to just ask you to talk about what someone would see uh, were they to come to the JFK Presidential Library. Uh, I don't know if you're open right now. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about your institution and what people could see if and when you're open. We're not open to the public yet, but I do hope we'll open uh, early in 2021. And uh, what, certainly the most iconic and famous thing uh, you would see uh, pretty early on, you would see the preserved coconut husk uh, that was used. It is, it, in terms of making of a superhero, uh, you know, I think many people marvel at his origin story. And it's not just, you know, who he was as a kid and coming through. We, we have that history of him as a, initially not a very serious student, but he grows, uh, particularly in, on the eve of World War II, to see the seriousness of the world. And he becomes a more serious student of history. Uh, but you, you would see uh, a Kennedy who, is, who wants to enter the war and is rejected because of all his illnesses and, and issues. And he 
asks his father to intervene on his behalf and get him in. And so he gets into the Navy and he's assigned to a desk job. And he says, no, I have to go to the front. And he asks his father to intervene again uh, and, and go to the front. And he's assigned to the Pacific Theater. And then you have the whole uh, sinking of PT-109 by the Amagiri and uh, in the, the incredible rescue of his men and then all of them rescued from the island and his recovery. And you see uh, sort of the depth of his heroism in those moments. Uh, and then you, then you would later go through the halls and you'd see one of my favorite objects in the collection, which is you would, you would see a, a framed uh, signed uh, piece, which I think is a, a great gesture of peace and reconciliation, but all the still surviving members of the ship, the Amagiri, sign a document congratulating him on becoming president of the United States. Wow. Wow. And, and Kennedy maintains a correspondence and a friendship with that ship captain from the war on. And that ship captain from the Amagiri actually comes to the U.S. and campaigns for Kennedy, which is just unheard of. And so I think you see Kennedy's charisma come to life uh, through acts and artifacts like that if you were to come to our library. And of course you would hear Kennedy's words in his own voice. Uh, we wish we had that. We wish we had his, that. <laughs> right? his, his convention speech about New Frontiers, his inaugural address, uh, and his many accomplishments from the Peace Corps uh, on. It's, That's remarkable. There's a lot to show. So I hope we can welcome you all when we reopen. Outstanding, thank you. Well, I, I'm, I look forward to, to, to being able to visit when you open your doors. Uh, we have one more question coming from the audience and uh, and thank you so much for, for spending so much time with us and talking to us about this fascinating stuff. Uh, the first hundred days. Um, uh, if you uh, try to, uh, FDR is famous for his hundred days and what he can accomplish uh, coming into the presidency. Uh, does, Was does JFK manage uh, to have an immediate transformative impact in 1960, or uh, what, is that, what does he manage to accomplish as president? You know, it's, it's interesting, and I think other historians uh, would speak to this uh, more directly than I would. Uh, my take on it is um, he doesn't have the strongest record of 100 days, right? There's a lot, there's a lot going on. I think, um, you know, his, his highlight moments happen later. I think you see a learning curve of a younger, less experienced president. Uh, he has some errors early on. Uh, the Bay of Pigs does not go well. Uh, and, and I think if you judge the administration by its earliest days, it would be a tough record. Uh, but he turns things around and, and he becomes more, uh, he, st he begins to become more progressive uh, on civil rights, though he has a ways to go, and his brother Bobby is pushing him hard to get there. Uh, uh, and certainly by the time he, he reaches the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, it is a stellar moment of diplomacy that, uh, that I think uh, positions America well uh, for the future. So I think it takes him a little while to mm -hmm. get traction, and, and the 100 days measure, which is common, uh, I don't know if it's the best indicator. Well, thank you so much, Alan Price, the director of the JFK Library. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. Brings to a close our five conversations on elections that have shaped the American presidency. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us, Alan. We really enjoyed it. Kevin, your audience, it's been a delight. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we uh, Again, please uh, come back to 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 view the ones that you've missed. These have been five fascinating conversations, mountvernon.org slash GW Symposium. Uh, they'll be there for you to watch at your leisure. Uh, you're going to learn something from each of them. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day, and thank you for a wonderful and successful George Washington Symposium. Bye.